Welcome to the Gospel Doctrine Helps class, where we provide you with insights, quotes, references, and help for your Gospel Doctrine class. Welcome back to another episode of Gospel Doctrine Helps class, where we look to help you with your Gospel Doctrine class and teaching it. And today we're looking at the Come Follow Me manual in the New Testament, and it specifically covers John chapters 2 through 4 in the New Testament. Now, quite frankly, there's no way to get through all of the material, so you're going to have to pick and choose what you talk about. But John chapters 2 through 4 is really good. Um, it starts with, um, if you're going to do chapter 2, it starts with the um, Jesus turning the water to wine at the wedding. Um, so I'm going to look at that real quick. If you read verses 1 through 11, that starts it off. That uh, gives us the information. So that is the miracle. It says, uh, on, and the third day there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. I suggest you look at the Joseph Smith translation of that verse as well. Cana was a small village in Galilee, and the tribe of Asher lived there in Cana. Um, this is the only place in the New Testament where this specific miracle is mentioned. It's not mentioned anywhere else. And verse 2, and both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. This makes it uh, seem like it was a family friend or perhaps a relative. It was somebody that they knew in order for Jesus and his dis disciples to be called to the marriage. Now, um, so there are some people who believe that this was Christ's marriage, that he married uh, Mary Magdalene at this at Magdalene at this ceremony, um, but there's no extant resource or or any definitive proof that this is his marriage. Um, in fact, I don't think it was. There's no evidence that says it was. It doesn't mean that Jesus wasn't married. It doesn't mean that Mary Magdalene wasn't his spouse. What it means is this wasn't his marriage. Um, let's keep going. Um, Oh, it's important to note here that turning water to wine was a sign of the Melchizedek priesthood. If you had the Melchizedek priesthood, you could turn water to wine. Um, and I'll give you the reference for that. It's actually Philo in the book Allegorical Interpretation, Volume 3, page 82. And this is the quote, But let Melchizedek, instead of water, the customary hospi hospitality gift, offer wine, and let him offer souls undiluted wine to drink. Also, Psalms 82, 1 is a verse to look at there about water being turned to wine. Um, jumping down to verse 4, Jesus saith unto her, Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. Uh, people look at this and they say, well, Jesus wasn't being very nice to his mom here. Uh, he's kind of rebuking her, but that's not the case. This is a common conversational phrase that was spoken gently. It means, in essence, don't worry. You don't quite understand what's going on here. Leave things to me. I will settle them in my own way. And using the word, the word woman in this context really means my lady. It's a tender and a respectful phrase. Uh, it's actually a term of endear endearment. So there's no rebuke offered here. We just read it in our vernacular and it seems to not translate right. So the Joseph Smith version says, or Joseph Smith translation says, What wilt thou have me to do for thee? Which is more of a, a polite request. What do you want me to do for you? And then she tells him, and he does it. Um, so that's that's enough about turning the water to wine. And then verse 12, they leave. They went down to Capernaum. Who went with him? It was him, his mom, his brethren, his disciples. Now notice it, it separates his brethren from his disciples. Um, oftentimes we, we hear the word brethren and we think it's the brethren of our church or those who are not related to us, but who we call our brothers. This is specifically referring to his brothers, uh, his um, biological brothers, uh, not just his disciples, not just church members. So it's actually his, his brothers. Um, verse 13 through 17, this is the, this talks about the cleansing of the temple. This is found in other places. The cleansing of the temple happened one day after Palm Sunday. So the temple, um, would have been, uh, it was about a half a shekel to enter into the temple. If you look at Exodus 30, 11 through 16, half a shekel in today's money is about, well, there's about three to three and a half shekels per dollar. So a half shekel would be, uh, less than a quarter. Uh, to get in, so not very much. More, more of seen as like a, a cost to help maintain the temple than it was to actually charge for admittance. But under Nehemiah, the people agreed to pay a third of a shekel per year for the upkeep of the temple, and that's found in Nehemiah 
uh, chapter 9, verse 30 through chapter 10, verse 10. Um, anyway, let's keep going here in verse 15 of John chapter 2. And when he had made a scourge of small cords, he drove them all out of the temple and the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changers money and overthrew the tables. So he did this and, and there's no words being spoken here at this time. He's simply doing it. You can also look at Mark 11 verse 11. The question that you ought to ask your class, at least a good question I like is, was this premeditated? Did Jesus think about doing this before he did it? And I think absolutely, right? Uh, uh, was Christ angry? That's another question to ask. A lot of people think he was angry when he did this. Perhaps he was, perhaps he wasn't. Perhaps he was simply resolute in cleaning the temple and doing a job and getting it done. And what he said, verse 16, is one worth uh, studying and talking about. And said unto them that sold doves, take these things hence, make not my father's house a house of merchandise. Now, what is his father's house? He's referring to his heavenly father, our heavenly father. How is it that we can turn our father's house into a house of merchandise? House has more than one meaning. He's not just talking about the temple. That's one meaning. He's also talking about the temple of your body, which is another meaning. House is also a familial relationship. The government of God is a family so how is it you make your family one of merchandise or your house a house of merchandise? Here's some scriptures for you to look up and perhaps use in your class. Isaiah 56 verse 7, Malachi 3, 1 through 3, Zechariah 14 verse 21. Um, compare this with, these are the other ones where Christ uh, throws out the money changers from the temple. It's Mark 11, 17, Matthew 21, 13, and Luke 19, uh, 46. It's also interesting to note here that uh, in verse 17, the disciples remembered that it was written, the zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. So again, referencing here to Christ, fulfilling scripture, cleansing the temple. Um, okay, let's keep going. Um, verse uh, 18, then answered the Jews and said unto him, what sign showest thou unto us seeing that thou doest these things? You see, Christ did them and the Jews are seeking a sign. And Jesus answered to them, verse 19, said unto them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. Now in Greek, the word is egerio, E-G-E-I-R-O, and it means to erect a building. But that word also means to resurrect. So you're seeing not just building a building, but resurrect his body. Um, so that's uh, in verse 21 where he says that, the body of Christ. What is the body of Christ? Is it just his body or is it also those who follow him? Look at 1 Corinthians 12, 27, 1 Corinthians 3, 16, 1 Peter 2, 5. And you should compare this verse, verse 19, with Isaiah 66, verses 1 through 4. If you want to get into the apocryphal text, uh, 1 Enoch 90, verses 28 through 29. This is also one of those accusations that was made against Christ during his crucifixion at his trial. They had a witness come in that said, he said that in, th in three days he'd be able to um, rebuild the building of the temple. Um, and of course, the Jews' response in verse 20 of John chapter 2, then said the Jews, 40 and six years was this temple in building, and wilt thou rear it up in three days? Verse 21, but he spake of the temple of his body. So he's talking about his body. Who is Christ's body? It could be you. It could be me. And that's one way to definitely look at it. Um, in verse 22, when therefore he was risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this unto them, and they believed the scripture and the words which Jesus said. Um, question to ask your class, when did they believe? When did the disciples believe? Did they believe it at the time Jesus said it? Or did they believe it after he was resurrected and they realized that that's what he was talking about? Uh, something to think about. Jump down to chapter 3. This is a great one. This is the title of the lesson is You Must Be Born Again. So obviously talking about baptism. But it's this great uh, chapter, chapter 3, that is when Nicodemus comes to Christ. We're all familiar with this story. Um, Nicodemus comes there, uh, verse 1. Uh, he was a member of the Pharisees, man of the Pharisees, Nicodemus. He was a ruler of the Jews. Ruler is another name for teacher. Um, he came, of course, uh, verse 2, the same came to Jesus by night. He said unto Rabbi, had uh, said unto him, Rabbi, Rabbi is a respectful term. It means enlightened heavenly guide. It means teacher. 
He says, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Now notice it says, it doesn't say I know. He says we know, meaning that there's more than just him that is aware of Christ and aware of what he's doing. Now, he's coming by night, obviously doesn't want to be seen by others, doesn't want the other members of the Pharisees to know that he's coming because he could be kicked out, perhaps excommunicated. So he's coming at night. I also want you to look at verses 19 through 21 when you're talking about this, because those verses reflect when Jesus is comparing light to darkness. He's coming at night. Uh, also look at 1 John chapter 1, verse 7. You see, when Christ taught publicly, um, he could be heard daily. There was no need for him to be approached at night in private. However, Nicodemus did do that. He was a member of the Sanhedrin as well. He came to Jesus to examine him or to test him without his peers knowing that he was making this contact. Uh, Christ knew the heart of Nicodemus. Um, And if you go to uh, verse 3, it says, Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now he's talking about seeing the kingdom of God, not entering into the kingdom of God, not being a member of the kingdom of God. Perhaps the question is, ask your class, what's the difference? What does it mean to be born again, right? And what does it mean when when you hear the words verily, verily? Verily, verily uh, means I testify to you that. So in other words, Christ is testifying to Nicodemus of truth. It also means that he is one who is capable of testifying of truth. And so that's why he said unto him, meaning that Christ was able to communicate truth, salvation, announcing words of salvation, meaning that Christ was putting himself in the position of a lawgiver because he is a lawgiver. And he said, of course, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of heaven. And that means um, Christ was declaring the condition for entry, meaning being born again. Becoming a new creature is essential. Without newness, new birth, new approach to life, repentance, all things which Nicodemus followed would lead away from the kingdom of heaven unless he had this new beginning, this new start. Um, And Nicodemus, of course, his response was, how can a man be born when he is old? This is verse 4. And This isn't a rhetorical or meaningless question. I don't think it was said in ignorance. Nicodemus is testing Christ. If this new lawgiver possesses the capacity to announce new conditions for entry into heaven, he needs to explain the meaning of these new conditions. This is a Pharisee rabbi asking a young new rabbi the plain meaning of what he's just said. And Christ responded in verses 5 through 8. You should read these to your class. Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh. That which is born of the man's, uh, or born of spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but cannot tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit." Now it is put plainly, born as a new man by water, baptism, and by spirit, receiving the Holy Ghost, is required to enter into the kingdom of God. Without receiving these new ordinances from these new officiators, meaning John the Baptist and Jesus Christ, the old ordinances will no longer be accepted because there is a new dispensation that is here on the earth. This is a call to Nicodemus to receive the new prophets and those who are then preaching. Without accepting these new prophets and being baptized again, he could not enter into God's kingdom. Flesh is just flesh, right? It's what is required to get where God is, is required that we have a new spirit, a new life, and become connected to heaven. You cannot just rely on someone else's testimony. You can't just say because somebody else was baptized, that's good enough. You have to do those things. That's why I said the spirit goeth where it listeth, meaning heaven is unruly. It's unpredictable. You can't predict where it's going to be. It blows without predictability. The spirit is that way. You can't anticipate heaven's next move. It takes you to places where you've perhaps never been before. Just you can't sit down in the councils of the Sanhedrin with all the Pharisees and reminisce about the good old days and read the scriptures and think you understand them and get into God's kingdom. It doesn't work like that. Christ was teaching 
the teacher. And that was put to him. You must be born again. Jesus, uh, verse 10, Jesus answered and said to him, Art thou a master of Israel and knowest not these things? Master of Israel being a teacher. You're a teacher and you don't understand what I'm talking about. Read the profound truths that Christ is speaking here in 11 through 13. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, we speak that we do know and testify that we have seen and ye receive not our witness. What Christ is saying is, I'm telling you, I've seen these things. I know what I'm talking about. I've been into heaven and I have heavenly power, things that you're not aware of. Uh, verse 12, if I had told you earthly things and ye believe not, how shall ye believe if I tell you of heavenly things? And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man, which is in heaven. Some scriptures to reference here as you teach your class. Proverbs 30, verses 3 through 4. Deuteronomy 30, 11 through 14. Um, you need to spend some time in the scriptures under, to understand these things and also to teach these to your class. Um, uh, verse 14, I would then read verses 14 through 15, talk about those, and Moses lifted up the serpent to the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Son of Man meaning the Messiah. He's talking about himself as a sacrifice and in order to ascend to the throne. Remember, he was talking about no man has ascended up. He's talking about how to ascend up. First, you have to descend, then you ascend. Verse 15, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. You have to believe and not just believe. You have to act upon those beliefs. You have to be baptized. You have to receive the Holy Ghost. And when you talk about receiving the Holy Ghost, hands can be laid upon your head and you, can, and you are not told, I give you the gift of the Holy Ghost. You are told, receive the Holy Ghost. You are invited to do something to receive the Holy Ghost. It just doesn't happen automatically. You need to do something. And so us, as members of the church, ought to be doing something to receive the Holy Ghost. It's possible for someone to be baptized, to have hands laid upon their head by someone who holds the authority and yet not receive the Holy Ghost simply because they don't do something to receive it. It's an invitation. An action must be taken to receive it. Um, then I'd read verses 16 through 17, verses 18 through 21, 22 by itself, 23 to 24, 25 is great. And I'd read 25 uh, to the end. There's a few other um, things I'd like to point out. Uh, verse 17, for God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And this is important, uh, especially for us, because oftentimes as members of the church, we like to shame others, condemn others, and ourselves more than anyone else. And it's important to remember that Christ doesn't come to judge us and to condemn us. Yes, he is a judge, but he's also our advocate with the Father. And he doesn't want to condemn us, but he wants to save us. There's a, a, a difference here that's so important because we can get bogged down. We can beat ourselves up, and we ought not do that. We need to have a new life, have a new start, receive the Spirit, and be saved by Christ, not be condemned. Christ wants to save you. You condemn yourself by refusing to come unto him. The invitation is to come unto him. Uh, look at Moroni 10, verse 30, if you'd like to get to that in your class. All right, let's keep going. I'm going to jump to 27. Uh, John answered and said, A man can receive nothing except to be given him from heaven. Ye yourselves bear me, bear me witness that I said I am not the Christ, but that I am sent before him. Verse 29. He that hath the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth him, rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This, my joy, therefore, is full. And this is referring, uh, I'd also refer you to Revelations 19, 6 through 9. You must receive it from heaven. John's teaching the Pharisees something very particular here. This is obviously something different than the Nicodemus text. But I'm jumping around because I want to tell you, a man can receive nothing except to be given him from heaven. You don't get to go through heaven, go to heaven without connecting to Christ. You don't get priesthood unless you connect to heaven. You don't get the spirit unless you are connected to heaven. You don't just 
get it from another person. And you don't just get it just because hands were laid on your head. Anything you get from heaven must come from heaven. It doesn't come from another person. And then in, in 29, John compares the final triumph of the atonement to a wedding feast. We're all familiar with this imagery. Um, but in order to triumph, you have to go through tribulation. Man and a woman together in the image of God will put on a wedding banquet because they are like him. I've given you the revelation verse. Now look at Genesis 1.27. You don't have a wedding feast unless you're married. All right, jumping to verse um, 34. He whom God hath sent speaketh the words of God, for God giveth not the Spirit by measure unto him. Think about what this verse is saying. If you are sent from God, you will speak the words of God. If you don't speak the words of God, if you don't have Christ's words in you, then you're not being sent by him. It's pretty easy. You look, are they speaking the words of God? Do they have Christ's words? Christ had the words of God. It's one of the ways you could detect that he was a true messenger. Without the words of God, they are not true messengers. All right, uh, jumping down to verse or chapter four, we don't have a lot of time to get into these. I would point out in verse two, it says, Jesus himself baptized not, but his disciples. So it wasn't Jesus that was out baptizing, but his disciples went out and baptized. Uh, jumping to verse uh, 13 and 14 in, in chapter 14. This is the woman at the well. Uh, we're all familiar with this. Uh, Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. So a couple additional resources that you can use in uh, the teachings of the prophet Joseph Smith on page 40 to 41 is the prophet's blessing to his brother Hiram, Hiram Smith's blessing. It was recorded on December 18th of 1833 by the recorder, who at that time was Oliver Cowdery. I want to read just a part of this blessing. It says, He shall be as a cooling spring that breaketh forth at the foot of the mountain, overshadowed with choice trees bowed down with ripe fruit, that yieldeth both nourishment to the appetite and quencheth the thirst, thereby yielding refreshment to the weary traveler, and the goings of his feet shall ever be by the streams of living water. This is worth an entire, oh gosh, an entire lesson about living water. Why is this water alive? What makes it alive? Why is it a spring that gives you everlasting life? Who is the water? The water is Jesus. Why is Jesus like a spring of water, living, that gives you life? What is it that Christ gives to us that keeps us alive? You can reference uh, King Benjamin's talk in Mosiah where he tells us that he sustains us from moment to moment by lending us breath. Christ literally is a fountain of living water. You see, we're not just uh, physical beings and we're not just spiritual beings. We have both a spirit and a body together, which makes a soul. And souls need both physical nourishment as well as spiritual nourishment. The spiritual nourishment can keep you alive, alive in God. Without that life of your spirit, your spirit dies. You become hardened, mean, cruel, pitiless. Instead of loving, kind, long-suffering, gentle, meek, with charity, hope, and faith. Those are the things of the Spirit. Those are the things that Christ gives to you if you come unto him. It will be water that will spring up in you, everlasting life. Uh, I want to keep moving on, jumping to verse 34 in John chapter 4. Jesus saith unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me, and to finish his work. This is when the disciples were later saying, Hey, it's time to get some food. My meat is to do the will of him that sent me. Meaning, doing God's will sustains you. It's as if you had eaten. Even though you may be fasting, you may be going without food. It is meat to your soul to do that. 
and to finish his work. Um, referencing here to Genesis 24, 33, that's a verse you ought to look at there. And then verse 35, say not ye therefore yet four months and then come, comes the harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields for they're white, all ready to harvest. Oftentimes we look and we say, ah, timing isn't right. The timing is always right to do the work of God. It's always right. And um, there's a couple other um, things I wanted to share with you. These go back to the, um, I kind of forgot to bring these up during the uh, part about uh, Nicodemus in chapter 3. Um, but there's some additional um, references in the history of the church. We're talking about being born of water. And I wanted to give those to you so you could use them in your lesson if you want to. Um, give me just a second to pull those up. I seem to have taken out my my uh, my bookmark. All right, History of the Church, Volume 3, verses 392. Um, Joseph Smith said that being born again comes by the Spirit of God through ordinances. So oftentimes we look at that and we just say, it's just baptism. It's just laying on the hands for the gift of the Holy Ghost. No, no, no. There are other ordinances that this refers to and receiving the Spirit of God. Again, History of the Church, Volume 3, 393. I've also pulled out another one. This is History of the Church, Volume 6, verses 58. Uh, or sorry, page 58, it says, it is one thing to see the kingdom of God and another thing to enter into it. We must have a change of heart to see the kingdom of God and subscribe the articles of adoption to enter therein. You see, it's not enough just to see the kingdom of God. We have to enter in. And he talks about, Joseph says, subscribe to the articles of adoption to enter therein. You have to be willing to abide by the celestial law in order to enter into the celestial kingdom. If you don't abide by the law, you can't enter therein. So have a change of heart, as Joseph says here. To learn more about having a change of heart, look at Alma 5, one of the best discourses about having a change of heart. Change your heart. And then finally, one last one. It says, this is a History of the Church, Volume 5, page 258. If a man is born of water and of the Spirit, he can get into the kingdom of God. So, if you have not yet already been baptized, now is the time to be baptized. If you have not yet received the Holy Ghost, now is the time to receive the Holy Ghost. I hope this information has been helpful and you can use it in your lesson. We look forward to seeing you in the next one. Thanks for watching.